data-driven speed training. If infinite speed is the goal, we should teach to the test. I think this is an important thing that, that you know, I believe that speed is the number one, I believe Cal Dietz calls it a functional athletic predictor or something like that, that speed is, is truly, like if, if, if you could wish for one thing as an athlete in a ball sport or track or anything like that, it would probably be speed. Now, when, when you see data-driven, if you're a teacher, you understand that data-driven education is 100% bullshit. It's, it's absolutely horrible. It's horrible. It's a cancer. Um, because no test can measure academic curiosity. No test can measure a kid's love of reading, love of writing, uh, future motivation. If my chemistry kids are all stoked about taking chemistry classes in college, I've done a pretty good job no matter what that stupid test says. Those standardized tests. Now, so, so you say, well, gee, if that's bad, why is it okay to do this speed wise? Well, it's because 10 meter flies are not bullshit. So you need to be careful when you start talking about data, 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 because many things are measured just because they're easy to measure. All right, so it infects education like a cancer. Anybody that thinks of a multiple choice test, um, six times a year can measure the value, the worth, the effectiveness of my chemistry class is an absolute idiot. So yeah, I'm calling administrators all over the, all over the world idiots here because they all have bought into it or they probably know better, but they, they have to, uh, you know, they have to buy in uh, because yeah. And if you think about, if you've ever seen a standardized test, those of you who aren't teachers, um, it, it's pretty bad stuff. Now, when I went to Harrisburg High School in 1981, the prime measurement in the weight room, and I'm not so sure we should measure anything in the weight room, to tell you the truth, but the number one measurement was the bench press. They had a 225 club and the 315 club and all that kind of stuff, names on the walls. Um, that was the only club they had in the weight room. So why did they pick the bench press? to be the, the only thing that really mattered. Well, it wasn't because the bench press made you a better athlete. That's for sure. Matter of fact, guys with alligator arms are usually the best bench pressers. And if, if I was choosing, I'd probably want a long armed athlete. So what was it that made that coach? And they just played for the state championship in football the year before. So they must've been doing everything right. Well, the bench is a very easy thing to measure in the weight room. So we have to be careful that we measure things that truly matter. So Christian McCaffrey is one of my, my favorites, and I think a lot of people's favorites, and, and through TFC, I've gotten to be good friends with Brian Kula. So here's the question. Do we chase an, an infinite strength? And I would say hell no, because past a certain point, you are strong enough. Past a certain point, you will start growing in ways that actually interfere with the most important thing, which is speed. And Christian almost got in, well, he did get in that rut a little bit, and that's why he changed trainers, and now uh, things have changed a great deal for him. Do we chase infinite endurance? Hell no. That is like the dumbest thing in the world because once again, endurance hinders and tamps down speed. Uh, the more endurance work you do, the slower you get. And you probably know what's coming next. Do we chase infinite speed? Hell yes. That's, that's what we do. Uh, there's no such thing as being too fast. I love this tweet. I put it out in 2017, Adam Thaling. Um, it came from uh, Minnesota State. And not many football players in the NFL come from Minnesota State. Um, but he had a hard time getting noticed coming out of college, obviously. And I just love the statement. He says, I worked on nothing but speed until I could run a 4.45. Uh, you know, the, the singleness of that priority, I think, is really, really, really important. Because football players are always going to be in the weight room. I mean, that's just a given. You don't have to convince a football player to lift weights, but you really need to have that, that priority of speed. This is my favorite slide of all times, um, <laughs> that the average person has no idea about how to make anything a priority because they're just a um, 
bungled up, shook up mess in the brain, and they're going in every single direction, endurance, strength, special endurance, uh, uh, agility, flexibility, and, and they just forget how important it is that we really work on speed. And this kind of sums that up is that we want all of our energy going in the same direction or else it's going to be real hard to get faster. How do you train a cat? You sprint as fast as possible, as often as possible, staying as fresh as possible. Now, once again, this is just kind of, you know, we're, we're getting into the whole idea about why we test speed as much as we do. When I say as fast as possible, that means we spike up and go really fast. As often as possible, that is for a out, uh, an athlete with high outputs, that's probably three times a week. Staying as fresh as possible, well, I, I just, uh, I'm remote training a kid down in Knoxville, Tennessee right now, and they, they go five hours a day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, seven to 12. So he ain't going to be fresh on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, or Thursday night. So what, what we're doing with him is we're taking Friday off, totally off. And then we are speed training on Saturday and Sunday. You know, that's, that's our plan. We would never try to speed train him after a five hour session in the morning, nor do I agree with five hour sessions. My definition of sprinting spiked up timed times recorded times ranked times published. Now you say, well, gee, you know, we can't wear spikes or okay. Don't spike up. It's not as good, but you know, we always go to the next best thing. I think, uh, I think basically if you have, if you can time, you time it. If, if you can get your coaches to write the numbers down on a clipboard, do it. The second best thing, if you can't do any of that stuff, at least yell out their times so it's, it's meaningful. Kids will not sprint as fast if they're not being timed. That's just absolutely the fact. But if you can record them, rank, and publish, they're going to sprint faster. I think it's really important that this publish thing that we want to talk about this is a brand new slide. I've never said this before, but I, I really believe the coaches need to control the narrative. In other words, we control what, what people see from, um, from their viewpoint. And I don't think enough coaches do that. And, you know, that's why I'm on Twitter. That's why I have a website, all that stuff. And that's why, you know, I put all the propaganda and this is a, a tweet that I did, I don't know, um, sometime last winter, and it shows, uh, it doesn't look like a good picture, but it's actually a great video, okay? So the first thing I need to tell you right now, never post a bad video, never post a bad picture. I don't care if you want to pump up your slowest kid or not, don't put it out there, because you want to control the narrative. You want people to see you as a speed factory, as a high-performance coach as a uh, that you care about that perception uh, not only do you post a great picture or a great video but you see the blue link there um, you see the the Google Doc link if, if you click on that you go to the rankings on a Google sheet you also see that I have posted for this one I posted the best four times and uh, Jalen Tillman has the video Jacob Jones it was like his second practice. I wanted to make note of that. He's a rookie sophomore and Sebastian Metcalf moved in this year. So, so I, I'm giving those people some credit. Uh, also, I posted that 19 of our 28 kids on this day ran a PR. That's pretty powerful. And that's what the gauntlet can do. But the important thing about this slide is not the gauntlet. The important thing about this slide is that you have a chance to, to control how people and how kids see your program. Now, this is a history, two slides about the history of uh, Record, Rank, and Publish. Uh, when I took over a weight room back in 1996, I'm not a big weight room guy, but I'm a reader. Um, so I read Bigger, Faster, Stronger and highlighted it and took notes and all that stuff. And Bigger, Faster, Stronger gets a lot of crap right now because, you know, it's just, it's out of circulation a little bit and all that. But what I loved about it was, it was so data-driven. It They really cared. And what I didn't like about it was every kid wrote down their own data. I didn't like that part of it. So I simplified and we had a clipboard and we, we divide our weightlifting groups because we had only like two racks. I mean, we were a small school, a poor school. Um, so we divided our six core lifts into our A group did two of them one day, 
They would do two different ones on Wednesday, two different ones on Friday. So we were able to keep track of the numbers and it was really important to me that they we recorded, ranked, and published. Now published back in 1996 meant that we put we taped it to the, the plywood of the pole barn that we called a weight room. So that's how we published. But it was still important that we published it, and it took a lot of work for me, but that's how I got good at, at spreadsheet. This is actually, this is kind of fun. Not only did we keep track, but and, and not only did we show rankings, but we also kept records. And we divide the records up into five weight groups. If you're over 225, you're a heavyweight. Um, and then, you know, we had three different weight groups, then 150 and under. So we had five different weight groups. So somebody named Roger Barefoot, when he benched 195 five times, when he weighed only 135, that was a record. If uh, Across the top, these are the six lifts we did. We did a bench, uh, a five-set rep uh, on bench, five on deadlift, five par parallel squats, five cleans. And then for pull-ups and dips, we, we would literally count three different sets, maxing out, and then add them all together. Obviously, the big guys didn't do many pull-ups. Um, and then at the bottom, the 40-yard dash was the thing we did 90% of the time. But one day we did uh, do the 100-meter uh, fly. We did the 200-meter dash. Uh, anytime it rained, we would do vertical jump and standing long, long jump in the hallway up by my chemistry room. And then on one day, we actually did a 400 meter dash. But this, this record keeping, this, this uh, uh, really caring about data, I think really, I mean, the buy-in of the kids uh, was just incredible. And uh, um, I wrote an article um, about Record, Rank, and Publish where you know, I actually gave the incredible success that Harrisburg had in all sports during that 1996 to 204 time period. And I think this had a lot to do with it. This was the article, by the way, if you wanna read it, um, The Origin, Evolution, and Future of Record, Rank, and Publish, uh, also known as when BFS met FTC. So without data, you don't know where you've been and you don't know where you're going. This is a really important coaching thing. The, I'm not collecting data for the scientific, I don't think there is no, anybody that says the science behind what I do, I say that's total bullshit. You know, there's sports science is total bullshit and I'm a science guy, that's how I know that. So what I use data for is for the promotion, for uh, uh, encouragement with kids. Uh, I can say, look at where you were two years ago and look at where you're at. To me, I get tingles when I, when I can say those things to kids. Um, I, I tell the Tyler Hoosman story as often as possible. Uh, B team running back for me as a freshman football. I was the freshman football coach at that time. And uh, he ranked number 46 on a team of 63 guys speed-wise. 46 out of 63. He, he was slower. I mean, the only guys he was faster than were the fat guys. So if you look at the improvement of these times, this is not for science. This is for, this is for freshmen next year. When I time a freshman that's a 5.28 in the 40 or a 1.37 in the 10 meter fly, I can show him Tyler Hoosman and how he improved. And this is to me just incredible motivation stuff. And if you don't have data, you don't know where you've been. I, I'll tell this story. Quinn will probably get mad at me. Quinn, my son Quinn is at Andrew High School. They had 114 kids out today for their summer workout. And uh, he was a little disappointed. They were running through some, you know, the grass was kind of tall and they, you know, they weren't spiked up. They weren't on the track. But only seven kids out of 114. Only seven out of 114 broke five in the 40. And we're talking about a 6A school here. I mean, a school of like 2,300 kids. Only seven out. Now, you may say, well, gee, that's, that's bad. No, that's just what it is. And to Quinn, what that tells him is we've got to do better. We've got to double or triple or quadruple that number during the summer. And if all you care about is endurance, you'll never do that. So it's important to, that you know where you are at and you're honest with it and you're comfortable with looking at it and saying, okay, where do we go from here? And then of course, Tyler Hoosman's playing college football now. And to think that 
he was like <laughs> maybe the slowest freshman running back I've ever coached. And now he is a very fast college running back. It's kind of exciting. So I, I'm not going to get into the, the specifics here, but if you look, this is uh, from two years ago. Yeah, Marcellus was still on the list. Um, so in this situation here, I'm able to, uh, that magenta or whatever that purplish color is, on the far left, that's last year's average. The yellow is last year's best time. And then I'm able to show all the times and then give this year's average best, this year's best time. And on the right side, we have the 10 meter fly. So I'm able to quickly see that, uh, that Marcellus is about the same guy as a junior, as he was as a sophomore, about the same guy. So it's neither good nor bad. It's just, I know where he came from and I know where he is right now. And I probably, by looking at that data, know where he's gonna be in the future. We can also, this is one of my favorite things. This is not a speed thing, but this is the, uh, this is the 23 second drill. And the things I just wanna mention here is on the right, I have, the best senior distances where guys, you know, run 23 seconds, we see how far they go. The best ever in the last uh, 11 years. Is that right? Yeah. Since, yeah, I actually 12 years of recording these things. And so those were the best seniors. And you know, Marcellus is not in that senior column because he didn't have a senior year. He graduated uh, in December and went to Purdue and got third place in the indoor 60 in the big 10 as a 17 year old um, college freshman. So, so he never had a senior year. So Marcellus has the freshman record, the sophomore record, and the junior record. We've also, I've also made every All-Stater I've coached in red. So a kid that's a freshman can see where he ranks compared to freshmen from the last 12 years ago. But more importantly, he can see that, see how close he is to being at the same point of like, for example, Quest Young, I think won seven uh, All-State medals, seven. And he went 184 as a freshman. I had three freshmen this year on my team that went better than 184. Now Quest Young improved a lot, but still that really gives them some type of ownership that, that man, you know, I might really be special someday. So all this stuff is, is, is really important. Um, we also uh, have their freshman best, their sophomore best, their junior best, and their senior best. It's weird when I looked at this slide today, I realized I only had two seniors on my team. We didn't have any senior sprinters, but um, only two seniors on my team that had been with me for four years. So that's kind of weird. You know, but it's neither here nor there. It's just, it, it is what it is. And if we're not keeping data, then we don't know where we've been. We don't know what's happening now. I just, I don't, I don't understand when coaches say, no, we don't time in practice. Uh, I, I'm just, it, it, to me, it is the foundation of everything we do. I'll ask you a question. Yeah. Um, what do you say to the people that um, might push back if little Johnny or little Tommy is last on your record rank and publish and those parents don't like the fact that he's shown as being in last place? Well, if any parent ever did that, I would take him off the list. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, you don't win by going to war with a parent ever. And I, I don't want that little Johnny feeling sad. You know, that's now what I would tell the parent and little Johnny both is that instead of, of, of feeling bad, look at what Tyler Hoosman was when he was right. a and, you know, and I would explain to the parent that, that little Johnny never gets beaten in a race because we time solo. And so he is trying to beat his former self every time he runs. And by posting that time, we make that time more important to him. Now, it's important to note in 21 years of posting times, not a single, not a single parent or kid has ever asked to be taken off the list. 